A Hiker's Guide to Plants of the Desert Southwest, including cactus, wildflowers, native trees, interesting bushes, and the agave family. You'll learn where to find them, how to identify them, when flowers and fruit are available, and which ones are edible. Hey hikers! In this episode of my series, Hiker's Guide to the Plants of the Desert Southwest, we're going to focus on the bushes or shrubs that are both common in the desert southwest and unique to the area. The Native Americans who inhabited this region made extensive use of these plants for food and medicine. And I'll make mention of that info when relevant for the plant that I'm covering. So let's have a look at the interesting bushes that you're likely to see if you hike in the area. First on our list is the brittle bush. Arguably the most widespread and well-known desert southwest shrub. You'll see this blooming everywhere in March along roadsides and trails, in fields but especially in mountainous areas where it can be incredibly prolific, even covering entire hillsides. Each bush is covered with hundreds of marigold-looking flowers. In fact, many people confuse brittle bush with desert marigold, as the flowers look pretty similar. You can tell brittle bush by the fact that the flowers are held high above the shrub, making them a lot taller. The centers are more orange, and there are fewer petals. Brittle bush were the dentist's office for western cowboys. They would break off a stalk and use it for a toothbrush. Native Americans made a chewing gum from the white sap in the upper stems, and sap from the lower stems was used as a glue. Early settlers burned the sap as incense, which is why a common Spanish name for this plant is incienso. Next up is Ocotillo, or Fuquiriacea splendens. I hope I didn't just swear. If you know how to properly pronounce the name of this genus, let me know, because I'm really struggling with it. So the Ocotillo, or coach whip bush, uh, like the example right behind me here, out at the uh, Mavine Behan uh, Sanctuary, is uh, one of the oddest uh, members of the uh, Bujum family, uh, which you normally think of as being a Baja Mexico uh, plant. Uh, the Ocotillo is unusual in that it has uh, somewhat green stalks, which allow it to uh, to make food even when it doesn't have any leaves on it, which is a good thing because it can actually lose its leaves and regrow them up to eight times per year. That's its adaptation to the desert climate here. It'll sacrifice its leaves when the weather turns dry and as soon as there's a nice rainstorm, uh, the leaves will pop right back out again. They get beautiful flowers. They're called flags uh, by many people. Right on the tips of the branches and the hummingbirds love them because of their brilliant red color and uh, they must have pretty good nectar too otherwise the hummingbirds wouldn't flock to them. Yeah, I would be careful when you're photographing the flowers it's not uncommon to have a hummingbird sneak up right behind you and buzz you uh, because you can often hear them before you see them in the wild like this they can actually startle you a bit. So the Ocotillo or Coach Whip uh, here in the Mavine Behan uh, Desert Sanctuary um, in Tucson, Arizona. The flowers are actually edible with a sour lemon taste and make a good tea. The stems can be used as a living fence because if cut off the plant and stuck in the ground, they can sprout new roots. On a tour of Karchner Caverns near Benson, Arizona, we were told by the docent that Ocotillo are an indicator species of caves because they like limestone in the soil. If that's the case, there must be some limestone beneath Catalina State Park, because that's a great place to see these plants. These spiky bushes can get as big as 20 feet tall, as high as a small tree. They flower beginning in March and into May, and they don't need leaves to flower. Chuparosa, which is Spanish for hummingbird, is not a particularly impressive flowering shrub. The flowers are not large, nor are they all that plentiful on the plant. 
They are one of the few intensely red flowers of the desert southwest, and the hummers just love these things. One of the funniest things I ever saw was a hummingbird with a chuparosa blossom stuck to its beak. Chuparosa likes low elevations, below 2,500 feet. They generally bloom in February and March, but can rebloom if they get good rainfall. They're easy to recognize when in bloom as the trumpet-shaped flowers are very distinctive, but if they're not flowering, the bushes just kind of meld into the landscape. I'm going to just quickly mention the coral bean plant because it is so poisonous. Chances are you won't come across it, but the flowers are spectacular and the beans are pretty as well. Coral bean is often found around Native American settlements as it was used medicinally, but do not ingest any portion of this plant as you risk total paralysis. Our next purple flower is desert lavender, and it blooms shortly after the others we've covered so far. This one is in the sage family, which it closely resembles. The flowers aren't very showy, but pick off a blossom and rub it between your fingers and the fragrance is a real treat. The smell isn't exactly like domesticated lavender, but it is distinctive. This bush can get to be six feet tall and the same width. It's not distinctive from a distance. You have to get close to it and see the flower detail before you can be sure what it is. Desert lavender is a crucial food source for bees of the desert southwest. Native Americans made a tea from the blossoms and leaves that they used to treat hemorrhages. The creosote bush grows everywhere in the southwest, even in the driest of deserts. You may have heard that it gives the desert its unique fragrance after a monsoon rainstorm. And no, it has nothing to do with the stuff they put on railroad ties. Creosote bushes are easy to recognize with their tiny yellow flowers and puffball seeds, especially if you get close up where you can see the flowers and the seeds. Mature bushes are about shoulder height. Some folks in Mexico reputedly eat the flower buds like capers, but the Native Americans of the desert southwest considered creosote to be their pharmacy. They used it as a deodorant, dandruff shampoo, and treatment for colds and tuberculosis. The FDA discourages ingestion of creosote, so I recommend you just enjoy the flowers and the fragrance after a rainstorm. So right behind me is a uh, good-sized yoyoba plant that's just getting ready to start to bloom. Um, we're in mid-January here. It's a little bit early for the uh, flowers to develop, but we're not far off. The yoyoba was a very important uh, plant for Native Americans. Um, you may have heard of it before due to the oil. Yoyoba oil is a common ingredient found in shampoos. And in fact, uh, Native Americans uh, uh, use the yoyoba berries, which kind of look like small olives or large capers, uh, for shampoo, among other things. So uh, the yoyoba plant, uh, a very important part of the uh, Sonoran Desert ecosystem. Yoyoba bushes are typically found on hillsides where the cold air drains during the winter, as they don't do well with frosts. Look for them wherever you see saguaro cactus who are attracted by the same conditions. The bushes are three to four feet tall and about the same width. What makes them easy to recognize is their distinctive oval leaves. The berries are not considered edible, so don't chow down if you come across them when mature. I first heard about Mormon tea while reading a Grand Canyon hiking guidebook where its presence is used as an indicator that you are descending below 4,500 feet of elevation. That made me curious, and I have even found it in my backyard. You may have heard of ephedra in the 90s, when the Chinese version called mahuang became popular and a dangerous diet drug. 
I remember the name by thinking of Sudafed, the cold drug, which is pseudoephedrine, which is chemically related to the ephedrine found in the ephedra species. The North American species contain little or no ephedrine, but Native Americans use teas made from the plant to treat colds and allergies. The bushes are very distinctive. They are two to four feet tall and about the same width. They have nearly leafless, profuse green branches, which means like many plants here, it doesn't need leaves for photosynthesis. The flowers are profuse, but very tiny, so this bush is not known for its beauty. The flowers are followed by seeds, which, after roasting, can be made into tea or ground to make tortillas. Okay, a little botany lesson for you here on the Manning Camp Trail this morning. These are uh, manzanita plants. They're relatives of the blueberry. And uh, you can see the, uh, the berries that form on them. And these are a big favorite of the black bears that live here in the Rincons. Uh, quite typically here in Arizona, wherever you find manzanita, you find bear which is why the National Park Service provides bear lockers at the campsites so that they don't uh, maraud your food at night. So the manzanita. Manzanita is very easy to recognize due to its unusual smooth red bark on the trunk, which stands out vividly against the smooth green leaves. Manzanita flowers in late April and the small vase-shaped flowers look just like blueberry flowers. Not surprising, given how closely they're related. A month or so later, the berries begin to swell and ripen. They can be picked while still green, which is a good thing since the bears will eat them up before long. Traditionally, the fruit was made into a cider, but also makes a pretty good jam. Wolfberry is a very common bush in the Sonoran Desert, and there are about a dozen species that thrive here. They're easy to identify from their huge thorns and distinctive leaves. The small hanging flowers that come out in February tend to be pale in color. This Fremontii species is pale purple, but they can be greenish or brownish as well. The important thing about wolfberry is the berries. They are a close relative of the goji berry and taste delicious. Unfortunately, many critters find them equally desirable, so you have to get them while you can. Well, there's just a couple of uh, lonely wolf berries left on this bush here, so we're gonna pluck them and eat them. You gotta be really careful when you chow down on these guys because there's like a cherry pit on the inside. Hmm, pretty good, nice and sweet. The skin is a little tough, but uh, it's got a really nice flavor to it. Almost one of the better things I think I've eaten out here in the wild. Raspberries in the desert southwest, you say? Yes, in the mountains. The Chuacao Mountains are full of them, particularly along hillsides where wildfires have opened up the sunshine. This entire hillside is covered with raspberry plants. Pretty amazing. Let's zoom in so you believe me. There we go. There's some raspberries kind of intermingled with ferns due to the high precipitation up here. Not a lot of uh, ripe looking berries on there. but It's uh, not too far from where I've seen or I've had bear encounters in the past, which is not surprising where you have bear food, you will have bears. There we go. Not a lot, but it's a mouthful anyway. So, uh, let's see what they taste like. 
Well, most of them made it into my mouth. A little on the seedy side, which is to be expected. We had really good uh, winter rains this year, which I think caused the raspberry plants to do extremely well in the spring. So the plants have grown extremely well, set a lot of fruit, but we've had a very dry summer. The monsoons really haven't started in earnest yet. So I don't think the plants have enough water available to make really big juicy berries. So there's berries on the plants, but they're pretty small and seedy. Still, pretty tasty snack, I gotta say. Rosary baby bonnet bushes are a nondescript shrub for most of the year, but starting in February, it gives us several months of beautiful little flowers, followed by brilliant red-colored bean pods. It's easy to recognize when blooming. The white-yellow pea-looking flowers are really distinctive. No surprise that this bush is a member of the legume pea bean family. In late April, the reddish bean pods will form. The folks that named this plant thought the red peas looked like rosary beads. The seed pods have a sticky gum on the outside, and Native Americans use the rosin that can form on the stems as a glue to make jars airtight. There are three types of acacia commonly found in the Sonoran Desert, and the first one, Sweet acacia is the one most people know and love. With a little persistence, it can be pruned to be a tree. And when the little puffball flowers bloom, the scent fills the air. In the wild, it grows as a shrub, up to the height of 10 feet or maybe a little higher. The next variety, white thorn acacia, has almost identical looking flowers, but without the fragrance and the thorns are in a whole different category. As the name implies, they are white in color and make a wicked dagger. If you're into that sort of thing, dried sprigs can make an interesting decorative arrangement. In this case, paired with the thorn apples of Sacred Datura. Last is the aptly named Catclaw Acacia, which is actually in a whole different genus. The flowers are elongated and closely resemble the catkins from the mesquite tree. The thorns are smaller than white thorn, but they have an interesting hook shape that does a great job of lacerating your arms if you reach into the plant. Being members of the pea or bean family, all three acacias develop beans after the flowers mature. To my knowledge, none of these were considered good eats by Native Americans, though some critters will eat them. Many people mistake acacia for mesquite. Here's a couple of tips to tell them apart. First of all, acacia in the wild are much smaller than mesquite trees, as you can see in this setting where the mesquite trees are directly behind the acacia. Also, the leaves of the acacia are a fraction of the size of mesquite though they look remarkably similar. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned a thing or two from this video, and if you did, please click like, subscribe to my channel, or leave me a comment below.